And this evening's discussion is going to be the four Brahma Vihara as listed in the um, Shingi. And you should have a copy of the handout um, that I had, that we had um, attached to this invitation. So you can look at that as we're going along. And I'll just start by letting you know that, hold on just a moment. There we go. Um, and I'm just going to read down some of these things uh, for the most part, so you can go along. Uh, the word Brahma literally means highest or superior. It's also the name given to the supreme presence in the Vedic philosophy, shortly before and at the time of Shakyamuni Buddha, around the time of the historical Buddha. Vedic became Brahmanism, and so actually at the time of Shakyamuni Buddha, there was a transition from what is referred to as the Vedic period into Brahmanism, and then a number of centuries later, it actually became Vedanta uh, within the Indian uh, philosophical basis. And Vihara means to dwell, to live, or to abide. And the Brahma Vihara are also known as the four divine abodes, the four divine sentiments, the four boundless states, the four sublime states. Um, there's a number of different terminology that's used with these, these four items. And they're used for meditations, they're encouraged as thoughts, and they are actions to be cultivated. They're positive feelings and states that are productive and helpful. The result, the person will be free from ill will and hatred if one follows these. And that's really the, the, the basis of it. In the Mahayana, the Brahma Vihara are included among the perfect virtues, the paramitas, and these are states of mind required by the bodhisattva in order to lead all beings to liberation. When used as meditations, each of the qualities is directed traditionally toward a dearly loved person. Often this is viewed as one's mother, a neutral person, meaning someone whom you, you know, but you don't have a close relationship, and a person that causes difficulties. Sometimes they'll place in there between the dearly loved person and the neutral person, someone that you care for, but someone that you don't really have, uh, that you have a close relationship with, like an aunt or an uncle or a cousin or someone like that. So you'll see how these are used uh, in different ways, depending upon the source document that they're coming from. And the four Brahma Viharas are first referred to in the Anguttara Nikaya within the Pali Canon and also found in the Diga Nikaya. But then it's found in many different Mahayana works. Uh, and I won't, won't list all the works that it's found in. And when we look at the uh, four Brahma Vihara, we start with Maitri, which is unconditional love, like a mother who loves her only child. And Maitri is likened to a soft rain that penetrates the heart, relaxing the defense mechanisms associated with fear and ill will. Self selfish, selfish affection is metas or Maitri's, Maitri is near enemy. And by the way, uh, the Maitri is the term that's used in Sanskrit. Metta is the term that's used in the Pali. That's why you'll see it often as metta, uh, we'll be using Maitri since we're using, uh, we're Mahayana and use the Sanskrit. So selfish affection is Maitri's near enemy. And this affection that can, that will benefit the giver. In other words, when we think of Maitri and one is sending loving kindness or uh, directing loving kindness to our person, this should not be something which is self-serving. In other words, are you doing that because you have the expectation of something in return? Or are you doing that because it should be done? That's really what it comes down to. A selfish affection is referring to doing something because you expect something in return. I, live this, I love this person because of what they can do for me. I love the environment because it pleases me. 
that's different than loving kindness, which is unconditional, that is free from any conditions whatsoever. And so Maitri is that type of loving kindness. You'll sometimes see this just as love, as opposed to loving kindness. And I think that because in the Western uh, vocabulary, love has, well, from a Latinate origin, three separate meanings. Love can mean anything from something which is romantic, such something which is lustful, to the love that one has for um, one's family and the love that one has for humankind. Those are three separate types of love. And loving kindness, Maitri, is specifically the love that one has for humankind. It doesn't involve the other two types of love. Um, painful ill will is the far enemy, the opposing quality of Maitri. And obvious, that's pretty obvious, painful ill will. And so, when some, someone wishes ill toward another because of some quality that they have, I don't like that person because they're some nationality that you disagree with, for instance. Maitri is the capacity to love unconditionally. And we're going to be talking a little while about how we use these. Um, but just listen to the, what the qualities are to begin with. The next is Karuna. And Karuna is felt as a quaking empathy. I love that term, quaking empathy in the heart. The compassionate heart is softer than the wings of a butterfly. I pick up these terms from different places because they just seem to strike a, uh, the correct note. Karuna is, under, Karuna is understood to mean active sympathy or a willingness to bear the pain of others. And I'll be just talking about this in a little bit more, but let me just go through these, these um, what we have here first. In practice, prajna gives rise, prajna wisdom gives rise to karuna, and karuna gives rise to prajna. So karuna compassion gives rise to prajna wisdom, and there's a complementarity in which prajna wisdom gives rise to karuna compassion. Truly, you can't have one without the other. And I think that's one of the major uh, points here. There are means to realizing enlightenment and in themselves, they are also enlightenment manifested, if you will. Pity is the near enemy of Karuna. Pity is an emotion that draws a dualistic comparison. One of the phrases that I most dislike is a phrase that I hear people use all the time when they see someone who's had an unfortunate situation, maybe a terrible accident or something like that, and or a, a child that is born with some sort of affliction. And they'll say, there but for the grace of God goes I. That becomes a kind of pity. Uh, and that is, that's really something that you want to avoid in relation to Karuna. Um, Compassion's far enemy is cruelty. That would be the opposite of that. And Karuna is the capacity to remain present in the face of pain and suffering, but also to use upaya or skillful means to assist the recipient. I think that compassion is, is often misunderstood. I like to think of compassion as a verb. And that is because you have to, compassion requires you to do something. It's not something that you just feel. It's something that you actually have to act upon. And that's why it's, re it's referred to as active sympathy. So you feel sympathetic toward a situation, toward a person, whatever it might be. And the question is, what are you going to do about it? Um, this, sometimes we realize that there's not much we can do. And that's, that's worth knowing also when you recognize there's a limit to what you can do. But at the same time, we look at, at compassion, and the, the reason that we require wisdom to be involved in that, we don't require wisdom with Maitri. Loving compassion or loving kindness doesn't require anything other than our absolute recognition uh, of love toward the person, toward the situation, whatever it might be. 
Karuna, on the other hand, requires wisdom. And that is because sometimes what is best for a situation or best for a person is not necessarily obvious. It might even be counterintuitive. An example that I that I often use, so many people have heard this one, is um, you have a person who's an alcoholic and they choose to be, um, they choose not to drink at all. They choose to go without any alcohol. And it's a very difficult, it's a very difficult for a person who's an alcoholic who's addicted to alcohol to do that or addicted to anything for that matter to, to go in that way. And, and this is where we say um, a willingness to bear the pain of others. And a person who is an alcoholic, for instance, might come to you and just say to you, I really need a drink. You don't understand. I'm, I'm really suffering. I've got to have, I've got to have that wine or whiskey or beer or whatever it happens to be. I really need that. They're suffering. Can you bear their suffering and recognize that they've already said to you, if I, I'm giving up alcohol, I don't want to drink anymore. Can you bear their pain and say, no, I'm not going to go and buy you a bottle of, of whiskey. It may be very difficult because uh, I had an alcoholic mother, so I know Alcoholics can be very convincing <laughs> in terms of trying to and manipulative in terms of trying to get you to do things. But saying no may be what they need the most. That's compassionate. Compassion seems like, well, if I go get this person a drink, they're not going to be suffering. That's what compassion is. No, compassion is what's going to help this person most in the long run. Okay. Mudita or sympathetic or altruistic joy. Mudita is the word from Sanskrit, Mpali, that has no counterpart in English. It's interesting. This idea does not have an English equivalent. There's no word in English that, would, that you could transfer, translate this into. It's described as the inner wellspring of joy that is always available in all circumstances. Mudita strengthens the capacity to experience joy and happiness. It is likened to a flower at full bloom. The near enemy of mudita is exuberance. And the far enemy of mudita is resentment. Mudita is the capacity for boundless appreciative joy and gratitude. It can be a little bit difficult to understand. So let me pro provide an example of, of mudita. You're working with someone and in the same job, you and another person has the same job, and you're both uh, um, eligible for a promotion. And you're both working really hard for the promotion, but the other person gets the promotion. And there's part of you that's really disappointed because you thought that you had done all you could to get that promotion, but your colleague got it rather than you. Having sympathetic joy means you're happy for the fact that your colleague got that promotion. You didn't get it, but you're happy for them. They got that. It's something that they worked hard for. They deserved it. They got it. And so that's really um, Mudita is feeling altruistic joy for another person. The fifth century scholar, Buddhaghosa, included advice on growing mudita in his best known work, the Visuddhimagga, or the Path of Purification. The person just beginning to develop mudita, he writes, Bodhigasa said, should not focus on someone dearly loved or someone despised or someone one feels neutral about. Instead, begin with a cheerful person who is a good friend. Contemplate this cheerfulness with appreciation and let it fill you. When this state of sympathetic joy is strong, then direct it toward the dearly loved person and neutral person and a person who causes you difficulty. I will note here that in the path of purification, Buddhaghosa states that these four states are to be used only for shamatha concentration, not for vipassana, contemplation. 
I know it sounds it sounds like what? Wait a second. And the reason is because using the four states, there is a sense of calming the mind. There's a sense of of developing the correct attitude. Vipassana is insight into the nature of reality. Samatha is calming the mind. And that's why he would draw that, that distinction. Perhaps Ajishima Sensei could, could comment on that when we get to the, the comments later on. And uh, the last one is Upeksha, equanimity. And Upeksha means stability in the face of fluctuations of worldly fortunes. We could all use more Upeksha <laughs> during the COVID. That's, that's for sure. It's, the, it's one of the seven aspects of enlightenment. Equanimity is the mind resting naturally, free from attachment, anger, and delusion. Its function is to avoid giving occasion, excuse me, for the disturbing emotions to occur in one stream of being. The immeasurable quality of equanimity is an imperturbable composure of the heart, a love that embraces all living beings and circumstances with equality, wisdom, and serenity. Upeksha is equanimity in practice. This sense of responsibility grows with dignity and integrity. Indifference is the near enemy of equanimity. And what I'm talking about in this case is equanimity is not not feeling something. Equanimity is not standing back and allowing things just to happen. That would be uh, the opposite of equanimity. That's indifference. Equanimity is not indifference. Equanimity also requires action. The far enemy of equanimity is craving, clinging, and attachment. Equanimity is spacious balancing, enabling us to work with rather than against change. How often in the last several years have we actually been working against the changes that we've had to do? Equanimity is working with changes as opposed to against changes. Epeksha is the capacity to be with things as they are in reality. And I provided a small little table below here to lay out schematically what these four states are like with loving kindness. And you can see the object and the antagonist. I, I won't go through that. You can obviously read it. The four immeasurable thoughts are expressed in the following gatha. May all beings have joy and the causes of joy. May all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings never be separated from the joy that is free from suffering. And may all beings abide in equanimity, free from attachment and anger that holds some close and others distant. And it was said in the early sutras that one should memorize that brief gata with the four elements and use it daily in your life when you find yourself <clears throat> being uh, confronted with a disagreeable situation. That those are the, the, not just in meditation, but memorizing those and using those in a daily, on a daily basis. In meditation, there are two basic approaches to when we're dealing with um, meditation in general. One are techniques that develop the head aspect, such as analysis and concentration. And the second are techniques that open up the heart. Now, both heart and head practice are needed. One over the other doesn't really work. Gaining skill in different techniques that allows one to work more effectively in the different circumstances is what we need to do. The first three that is to say, loving kindness, compassion, and sympathetic joy, are considered the first three of the four meditated absorptions, or the 40 altogether in dhyana, while the fourth is the only one capable of producing the fourth 
meditative absorption. And we'll do a form of this meditation this evening to give you an example. So at this time, hold on just a moment here. And we will open it up to questions, comments, and thoughts. And I will unmute everyone and then ask for your questions, comments, or thoughts. I, I, I just love that little, that little guy. Isn't he cute? <laughs> <laughs> yes. What questions are, uh, Sensei, did you want to say something about the Buddha Gosa, since I know that that is someone that you've done work with? Buddha Gosa is a famous uh, uh, writer and uh, uh, you are discussing this uh, morning uh, for Brahma Bihara. Uh, that is very important uh, for the practitioners to have such a kind of lovingness or uh, joy to everyone's uh, happiness and uh, free from all attachment. This kind of uh, for Bihara uh, behavior, very saint behavior, it's very important idea, I think. Okay, thank you so much. If people have any other any questions, comments, or thoughts. Uh, Aaron, at first Aaron, and then Zenon, and then Linda. Aaron. Um. So I had um two quick small questions. Like one was, does meet like is there a relationship? I mean, just simple philological one. Is there a relationship between Mitria and Mitri? Like, is is there some relationship, or perhaps like, do we think of Mitria? Do we actually think of Mitri? And the yes. other was actually um, when I feel compassion, is it supposed to also have the fellow feeling the person has? I, I didn't just so what kind example, of feeling? Like a fellow feeling, like I know why, like do I feel like the fact that they're attached to that thing or should I feel like I'm sorry for what you're feeling itself? You mean with compassion, with compassion. Yes. Well, let me ask, let me answer the first one first, um, the Maitri question. And Maitreya is the same root as Maitri, the Sanskrit root. And of course, Maitreya is the future Buddha, the current Bodhisattva who will, after Shakyamuni, after the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha have gone from the world, then Maitreya will arise to bring the new teach the teachings again to the world in a fresh fashion. And the reason that it's that it's Maitri is because Maitri is the exemplification of loving kindness. In other words, it's loving kindness that will cause Maitri to um, to show in the world once again loving kindness for all all creation, if you will. Although creation probably isn't the right term, but you got the idea. Um, so that those two terms are absolutely related. And regarding compassion, compassion is to recognize, to have sympathy, active sympathy, to recognize that a person is suffering for whatever the reason might be, and to not just empathize with the person. Empathy may be the first stage to um, karuna or compassion. So once one has empathized with the situation, you don't stop there because that doesn't really solve the problem. That's just putting one into the state where you can better understand the problem. Now, go into it with wisdom and say, what can I do that is going to um, mitigate the problem that we see before us? How can I be of assistance to the person or to the situation that might be available? Does that, does that answer it, Aaron? Yes, thank you. Okay. And who was next? Xenon, I think you were next. Um, yeah, I had a question about, I heard from some schools of Buddhism that there's a sort of rule for, you know, practitioners to not associate themselves with like hoodlum, as in, it made me think of the example you gave with the alcoholic, you know, alcoholics asking for the alcohol and it being a better thing to not give it to them. So does that exist in Tendai or not? Well, I, I think maybe the best, thank, thank you, Xenon, that's a good question. 
I think that one of the um, instructions that we can get is from chapter 14 of the Lotus Sutra, because in chapter 14, it tells us that you don't hang around with dangerous wrestlers, jugglers, all kinds of folks that might get you into trouble, okay? Um, and, and especially jugglers. I mean, we all know how, <laughs> how jugglers are, right? And however, it goes on in that same chapter after it tells you not to do those things, not to hang out with those nasty folks um, as a general as a general rule, it tells you what you have an obligation to do something for them. You have an obligation to preach the sutra to them right. because they are in a situation that they could benefit from mm -hmm. the teaching. Okay. So yeah, on one hand, and, and so chapter 14 to me be, becomes a really important <clears throat> Uh, insight into that. And I, I realize some schools say, well, you just, you just don't hang out with a bad sort, whatever that might be. Right. And um, it didn't really make sense that, you know, we're supposed to have compassion and then at the same time, we're kind of right. rejecting these people. Right. And, and so there is not, there should not be um, a rejection in that respect. Uh, I, th I think in general, it's saying, you know, if you, there's a danger when you hang out with, with bad folks, um, but you still have an obligation to do what you can for, for folks if they, if they need assistance. Okay. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. And Linda, you had your hand up before. Right. Um, I was just wondering, like the, uh, the, when you, you, are you supposed to do the Brahma Viharas in order, like from loving kindness down to equanimity? Mm -hmm. I, from what I've read online, um, each one, each meditation prepares you for the next one. And all the top three prepare you for equanimity. So I just wonder right. if it's, can you do you have to do it that way, or can you do them separately, or you just well, do them in order. And I think both of what the things that you said are correct. That you start with um, Maitri and go down to equanimity. To uh, however, and you're right. The first three prepare you for the fourth for the fourth one. At the same time, there is a method of meditation in which you go through the four as the first stage, and then the second stage, you start with equanimity and work back toward Maitri. And the reason for that is similar to the reason that we look at uh, compassion and wisdom as being complementary, that you can have complete compassion, you can have complete wisdom, but However complete you may think it is, it's not truly complete until you combine the two together. Okay. And so, and so that's why in some cases you'll see they'll start with one going to four, but then they start the next series and they go from four and work to one. Okay? I, I knew someone who was doing it like out of order. I just wondered if that was proper or not. Oh, you know, that's that's going to that's going to cause them 64,000 lifetimes of bad karma. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just did, it seemed it seemed confusing for me. Uh, to do it that way. I thought you'd do it as like doing them in order, either coming down the scale or going back up. But could kind of picky or choosing which one you want to do and doing them all over the place. It seemed kind of haphazard. Yeah. Haphazard. Yeah. Yeah. I just okay. <laughs> okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. And uh, I think Ralph and then Brian. Yeah, uh, Monson, the, the, uh, the, the, the area that I was most interested in, well, all of this I'm interested in, but was uh, karuna, compassion, because you touched on it by saying that uh, uh, compassion, karuna, and wisdom are interrelated. Um, uh, and it occurred to me that one of the mudras, uh, hand positions when you're meditating, uh, is with the uh, right hand copying the left hand. Um, and then I was told that the left hand stood for wisdom and the right hand for compassion. And I had always felt that compassion was supported by wisdom. Um, uh, and then you went ahead and made the statement that they're interrelated. And I thought, I, I, I thought maybe you'd go ahead and elaborate on that a little bit. Well, using using the example, and, and you're right, usually with shamati, you put the left hand in the right hand, uh, cupping it, I don't know if you can, where I'm mm -hmm. holding it like this, okay? Yeah. And um, however, if one does a um, esoteric practice, you reverse it. 
Okay. And then, and then the, the left hand cups the right hand as an example. And the reason for that is that the left hand is considered to be more static and the right hand is considered to be more dynamic. The right hand is considered to be uh, compassionate and the left hand is considered to be wisdom. And if you look at the, at the um, mandalas at the front of a, of a Tendai temple, and I'll just point something out, which has been pointed out to me by Ichishima Sensei many times, that if you look at the mandalas at the front of the temple, the Taizukai is on the right, and that represents um, compassion, and that's feminine by nature. The one on the left-hand side will be the, the Kangukai, and that is, represents wisdom, and that's the masculine. And so in Tendai, we go from compassion to wisdom. Shingon has it reversed. And they would put them on the other side, and they mean exactly the opposite uh, sort of thing. And But in both cases, in both the Shingon case and the Tendai case, you do one and then you do the other. And the idea is that you unify them through the esoteric practice. It's, a, it's the unification of the masculine, the feminine, the wisdom, the compassion, et cetera, et cetera, of the dynamic and the, and the static. So it's, it's really necessary. Sensei, would you want to comment on that? Mm. Yes, uh, wisdom and compassion is a basis of Buddhism. And uh, that was uh, symbolized by mudra. Uh, in the case of esoteric Buddhism, right hand is uh, wisdom, left hand is compassion. Uh, and also uh, <clears throat> the uh, mode of sitting or making mudra a, a little different uh, from Zen Buddhism in uh, Tendai. And uh, in the case of Zen, uh, they think that the uh, uh, right hand is a more powerful or active one, and the left, left hand is uh, 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 very, uh, what shall I say? Uh, static. Uh, not, not static, yes. So you know, to stop, stop the uh, <clears throat> moving of mind, uh, left hand uh, placed on the right hand. That is Zen style. In the case of esoteric Buddhism or uh, Vipassana style in India, right hand more emphasized as uh, wisdom. Uh, so wisdom uh, should be revealed through the practice. So uh, both the same, but a uh, little bit the form of making mudra is different between two. Thank you. Did, did that answer it, Ralph? Um, yes, to a great extent it did. Uh, and I guess the bottom line is what you said, and that is that uh, uh, karuna and, and wisdom uh, are basically interrelated with each other. Um, uh, I think the exact word you did was you said was uh, compassion brings about wisdom, and wisdom brings about compassion. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah. Thank okay. you, Ralph. Brian. Thank you. Um, I guess if the, I, I learned these with the term four sublimes. And I think the one that always caught my attention was the last one, equanimity. And I guess I, I was wondering, because in my head, because I see what, what the, 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 the near um, enemy and the far enemy, and I often found being here in the West, another enemy for me in equanimity was the concept of hierarchy and the hierarchies that our culture is full of. And I was wondering if that, that had any part in thinking about equanimity. I don't, I don't, I've never, I've never seen it uh, emphasized that way. And I would think that that hierarchy you find also in Confucianism, which was part of Buddhist practice in China. And so I don't know that, that hierarchy would ever be seen as not having equanimity. I, I would say that equanimity would come about regardless of where you were in the hierarchy that, that you would recognize the nature of reality mm -hmm. and uh, not accept it per se uh, as a given but understand the nature of reality and to look at the hierarchy as it existed 
um, and change when you can and to abide when you can't. That's how I would view it. That's how I would view it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sure. uh, Job and then Mushin. And then and then that'll that'll be it for the questions for this evening. But Job first. It, yes, uh, this is a question to both you, uh, Mushin Sensei and uh, Ichishima Sensei. I would like to hear from you how you understand the nuance of the uh, word dihara, uh, to dwell or to abide. But in Japanese also we, we not only say shimuryoshin but shibonju, right, ju, to dwell. Uh, and uh, this word uh, vihara, to abide, uh, reminds me of two things. Number one, uh, in the Lotus Sutra chapter 10, uh, there's a statement that the room of the Tathagata is, is, the, is compassion. Right? Uh, and, and also the garment of the Tathagata is uh, forbearance, the seat of the Tathagata is uh, emptiness. Uh, and I, I was wondering whether there's any relationship to that. And also it, uh, this reminded me of what we have in the New Testament, uh, the book of John chapter, I think 15. There Jesus says, abide in my love. Uh, and there's a nuance of you have to nurture yourself by being in that virtue or divine virtue. So I just wanted to hear from you both, um, both of you, how you understand the nuance of the word vihara, to abide or to dwell. Sensei, would you like to, to answer first? Uh, vihara generally uh, translated into English, uh, just a church or such a you know, place where uh, people gathering, ask for prayers, etc. So Bihara is a very uh, quiet place in Sanskrit uh, to dwell. And uh, <clears throat> so, uh, and also the uh, Jindo Sensei uh, just uh, pointed out that chapter 10, that is uh, the, such a, you know, <clears throat> room, uh, room of the Tathagata uh, uh, and the uh, seat of Tathagata, etc. This kind of a, uh, expression, I think, refers to vihara. That the uh, ideal state of mind is a vihara, where uh, mind uh, is uh, becomes very peaceful. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And and uh, Job, I, I think that when I look at the vihara, I, I certainly accept everything Sensei said, and I think that that's the, uh, a good understanding of it. But I think of the abiding, I think the term you used when you were referring to uh, John in the New Testament had to do with cultivating. And so all of these are, all of the, the four Brahma Viharas are cultivating these qualities, cultivating the quality of Maitri, cultivating the quality of Karuna, et cetera. And that cultivation means abiding and it means to live it. It doesn't mean just to... Uh, look at it as an ideal to to view it as an expression, but how do we live these qualities? How do we live my tree? That's really what we're what we're talking about. How do we live karuna? That's how I take the the vihara as an abiding. How do we abide and cultivate it? Okay. Thank you. And and uh, Ursula or Gary, I don't know which one have your hand up. <laughs> Okay, uh, just uh, a technical question, really. Um, the ter terms near and far, I, it's such an effective uh, terminology. Is that yours? Is that something in the tradition? No. That's something in the tradition. Yeah, yeah. it's That's in the tradition. tradition. Oh. Yeah, yeah. The near is. <laughs> Very, yeah, I, I, I agree very, with you. I, I think they're very, I think they're very effective terms. You know, yeah, they, they really describe it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, Mushin, did you have a, a question or a thought before? Yeah, I have a comment. Uh, I've been uh, uh, focusing on sympathetic joy, uh, taking uh, pleasure and, and joy in the accomplishment and happiness of others and find that uh, very valuable in increasing my own experience of happiness and joy. Thank you, thank you. 
Okay, I think that we're, we're going to um, move along. This was a short meditation, only a little over 15 minutes, but it gives you a guide to how to conduct the meditation in the future. You know, early in our Buddhist practice, most people begin to sit meditation or do other forms of practice in order to improve oneself. And that's okay. As time goes by, if we practice in earnest, especially in Tendai and in Pure Land schools, we recognize that Buddhist practice is not a self-help program, like going to the gym or doing yoga. That's not to say that there are not what I refer to as collateral benefits to oneself becoming calmer, less anxious, more open, et cetera, through the practice. This is often difficult for people who are first embarking on the path to fully understand. The heart of Mahayana Buddhism teachings is not what, what it does for oneself. It is what it does for all sentient beings and by extension for oneself. Mahayana is the path of the Bodhisattva. At the end of the Gongyo, we recite Soeko, transferring merit, which reads, I wish to extend the virtue of these verses to all sentient beings. Together, may we progress along the Buddha path of liberation. In other words, one has dedicated the daily service, the purifications, the offerings, the venerations, etc., not merely for oneself, but for the benefit of all sentient beings. The Brahma Vihara that we discussed this evening also demonstrates that in a very direct manner. This meditation is especially useful when the practitioner needs to be a bit more humble and grateful. I mentioned that there are two basic types of approach. The first are techniques that develop the head aspects, such as analysis and concentration. And then there are those techniques which open the heart. Both head and heart practices are needed. It is a heart practice that is especially difficult. One must enter this practice without thinking about what am I going to get out of this? We enter into it with a kokoro, heart, mind, spirit, that is filled with altruistic well-being for all sentient beings. We started with oneself so we can address our personal individual failings. We went on to those whom we love, our family, because that's easy. And then to the community at large, the Sangha, our neighbors, other people in our city or town. And finally, to all sentient beings, including the animals in the fields, the trees and shrubs, the mountains, the ocean, on and on. In this fashion, we see ourselves not as distinct from these various layers of interaction, but integrated in a very real and harmonious way. We give up the I as distinct from the other and see ourselves as the we and us, the real nature of the I. Try this Bhamra Vihara meditation once a week to better understand the reality of the I as integral to the whole of the universe. Svaha. There we go. Once upon a time, I dreamt I was a butterfly fluttering hither and thither to all intents and purposes a butterfly. I was conscious only of my happiness as a butterfly, unaware that I was myself. Soon I awaked, and there I was, veritably myself again. Now I do not know whether I was then man dreaming I was a butterfly, or whether I am now a butterfly dreaming that I am a man. <laughs> and this is by Chuang Tzu, the very famous Taoist practitioner. 